The following KQED production was produced in high definition. She spent more than 7,000 hours of her life underwater, working to study and save our planet's oceans. And in 1998, she was named Time Magazine's first ever Hero for the Planet. So if the name Sylvia Earle isn't familiar to you, it should be. The Oakland resident is a National Geographic Explorer in Residence and was the former chief scientist for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A world expert in aquatic plants and marine ecology, Sylvia Earle has led hundreds of ocean expeditions and published more than 150 papers and articles, along with several prominent books on marine science and technology. Since the 1950s, she's been a pioneer of undersea research and exploration, fearlessly pushing the boundaries of what humans can do in the deep blue. I was really fortunate to have a chance to use some of the first scuba systems that were made available in the United States. First time I jumped into the water with a tank on my back, I wasn't really convinced that you could do it, you could breathe underwater. But when I put my face down and I actually could do it, it was such a gift, it was such a, a lift. It's still a joy every time I jump in. Since that first magical dive at age 16, Earl has taken the plunge again and again. But as liberating as scuba was for her, eventually the limitations of the gear left her yearning for more. Early in her career, she decided if she was ever going to comprehensively study marine organisms in their environments, she'd need to stay underwater for longer than scuba technology would allow. Finally, she got her chance. In 1970, not long after earning a PhD from Duke University, she lived in an underwater laboratory off the U.S. Virgin Islands for two weeks as leader of the first team of women aquanauts. It was part of an experiment by NASA, the Navy, and the Interior Department called the Tektite II Project. We had four-hour dives. That's not possible in a single tank of air. But since we didn't have to go up, all the decompression took place at the end we could stay down indefinitely. We spent 12 hours a day and night. We could go in and out, sleep, eat, write up our notes, look through microscopes in the warm, dry inside of our underwater house. It was just terrific. Diving with the Tektite project. Headlines all over the world. It caught the imagination of people. Five women living together underwater. I mean, it was such a concept back in 1970. The next big headline, I suppose, was a few years later, 1979, when I was working on a project with the National Geographic, and I discovered that there was this diving suit called JIM, J-I-M, operated by Oceaneering International, mostly for commercial uses in the offshore oil and gas industry. And one thing led to another, and it finally turned out that, okay, I would get to try that suit as a scientist to evaluate it for scientific purposes. The gym was a metal diving suit that maintained a normal atmospheric pressure inside, allowing divers to go to depths of 1,500 feet, 10 times deeper than with traditional scuba gear. Earl's 1979 gym suit dive set a record for the deepest dive ever made without a cable to the surface, and the experience would forever change the course of her career. I got down to 400 meters, 1,250 feet, there were bamboo coral. These are unbranched, single whisker-like corals that grow in a spiral, six feet tall or more. I reached out and touched one, and rings of blue luminescence, blue fire, pulsed. If I touched it here, the pulses would go up. If I touched it here, the pulses would go down. If you, you touched two places simultaneously, you got these rippling rings of blue fire going up and down. It was such a joy to do this. I mean, I, uh, well, I get a, I still get chills just thinking about what, what a breakthrough it was for me. And that's really what got me started, wanting to develop submarines that I could drive 
So I began discussions right there on the spot using the gym with one of the engineers involved, Graham Hawks. From their experience with the gym suit, Earl and Graham Hawks went on to develop a mini submarine called Deep Rover. It was everything the gym suit wasn't, nimble, fast, and easy to manipulate. In Deep Rover, she set yet another depth record in 1985, the first solo dive at 3,300 feet. It's a leap beyond scuba. Here we are at 1,300 feet looking at Spanish dancers in action. And I do dream of the day that lots of little micro submersibles will be out there. People should be able to have access to the sea so they can understand it, take care of it. Sylvia Earle spent the early part of her career realizing her dream of gaining access to the deepest and most remote parts of the ocean. But it's what she learned down there that has shaped the latter part of her life. In my lifetime, since I was a child, more change has happened in the sea than during all preceding human history. It sounds like a big, bold statement, but it is true. We've lost on the order of half of the coral reefs. We've seen an explosion of dead zones in coastal areas around the world. You can boil it down to simple things like what we're putting into the ocean, carbon dioxide, excess carbon dioxide that is not only a problem for warming the atmosphere and driving the temperature up, but also driving the acidification of the ocean toward new levels. The other category of problems, though, comes from what we're taking out of the ocean. In the past 50 years, we've seen the loss of 90% of the big fish in the sea because we've taken them. They, they aren't lost. We know where they've gone. We've eaten them. In the process of taking out of the sea, trawls, dredges, long lines have a huge bycatch. Other creatures that are taken and simply thrown away. The habitat itself is destroyed when a net goes across the bottom. It's like using a, a bulldozer to catch songbirds. I mean, I used to eat a lot of seafood before I knew, before I actually went diving into the ocean, could see these great swaths cut across the seafloor where a trawl had destroyed the nature of the seafloor. And I'm not saying you have to stop fishing. I am saying we have to stop fishing irresponsibly. And we have to stop killing creatures we cannot take sustainably. For the last two decades, Earl has worked tirelessly as an ambassador for the oceans. From 1998 to 2003, she traveled the globe as part of the National Geographic Sustainable Seas Expeditions helping to raise awareness and funds to establish tens of thousands of acres of new marine sanctuaries around the world. And as always, she's continued to focus on innovative tools that make it easier for humans to understand the planet's oceans. In 2006, I was at a conference where I had a chance to give a talk, and so did the man who was the head of the phenomenon called Google Earth. And I had a chance to publicly say with John Hankey, who's the, in charge of Google Earth, how much I love Google Earth. And it, I didn't plan it, but it just popped out. I said, and John, I hope someday you'll finish it. You've done a great job with the dirt, but what about the ocean, the water? It's missing, big blobs of blue. And to not be able to see that the mountains continue from the beach right down into the sea, it seemed obvious. And to his credit, John Hankey, said, well, okay, what do we do about it? For three years, she consulted with Google engineers to figure out how to fill in those big blobs of blue that comprise more than 70% of our planet. In February of 2009, Google Oceans was finally unveiled, but the work is by no means done. Less than 5% of the ocean has been mapped in any kind of detail. You've got the broad strokes, but you'll see if you use Google Earth, some parts are in great detail. Other parts get pretty fuzzy pretty fast. So as it becomes available, the whole world is going to be known in much better detail and accessible to little kids and big kids and decision makers and car mechanics and housewives. You can play on the planet and see how things tie together and see what we're doing to the ocean. Now, 
At age 73, Sylvia Earle is more determined than ever to explore what she calls the blue heart of the planet. I breathe, I dive. <laughs> I'll be exploring, I hope, for as long as I live. I long to be able to explore the deepest part of the ocean. Plans are underway right now to develop systems that I hope will be built soon enough for me to actually be among those who go to the deepest place of the sea and to see what's there, to incorporate it into our thinking. This is a pivotal time in history, and the key goes back to understanding and knowing. The next 10 years could be the most important, and I think they are the most important, in the next 10,000 years. It's this critical window when we can see the consequences of our actions. We have the power, it's within our grasp, but it, it's not going to be that way if we continue business as usual because the trends that we have already set in motion will continue. Every day that passes, it gets harder. So let's get busy, let's hurry while we still have time. This is the time.